thank you all. Uh, I'll keep my introductory remarks uh, brief, and we'll get right into it. Um, it. It was a really interesting first panel. Uh, the division uh, tonight is meant to be that uh, that first discussion was about uh, these horrors and, and the situation inside uh, North Korea that Judge Kirby's report uh, has, uh, has made public. Um, but we need to follow up because uh, uh, one must get at the question of what needs to be done. I know there was much discussion about change coming from within and these straws in the wind that uh, Judge Kirby and many of the others on the panel uh, spoke about. Uh, but there is the question. Thank you. Uh, there is the strategic and humanitarian question of what the rest of the world uh, can do, should do. Uh, I thought it was interesting how many times the word engagement uh, came up in that first discussion and then the word pressure. Uh, but I think if I heard right, there were both arguments for engagement and against and arguments for pressure and against, so we'll delve into those. Um, I do want to, uh, I know you have the bios, but uh, uh, where I used to work at ABC News, uh, when we had a really good Sunday morning talk show uh, group, uh, they used to call it a powerhouse roundtable, and I'm reminded of that phrase, both with the first panel and this one. So just very briefly, um, uh, Ambassador Chun Young Woo, uh, to my left, uh, Chairman now of the Korean Peninsula Future Forum uh, and Senior Advisor at the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, he had a distinguished uh, three-decade career in diplomacy and government uh, in Korea, last serving as National Security Advisor to President Lee Myung-bak. Uh, to his left is uh, Ambassador Robert King, U.S. Special Envoy for North Korean Human Rights Issues. If I'm right, that's you, you are just the second person to hold that post. Uh, and uh, before that, uh, 25 years on Capitol Hill, Chief of Staff to California Congressman Tom Lantos, uh, and Staff Director of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. As Bruce said, uh, Judge Kirby uh, does not need an introduction. Of course, the, uh, among many other things, the author of the uh, commission report. Um, and so to, to dive in here and to pick up really where panel one left off, uh, I thought I'd, I'd begin with a point about the impact of the commission's report uh, when it first came out. And to some extent, this continues now. Um, Whatever you three gentlemen may think, uh, uh, it's a fact that one impact, particularly I think in this country, but in other parts of the world as well, has been to galvanize those who may already have been uh, of a mind to say that there can be no dealing uh, with the North Korean regime. Uh, and that the crimes that you lay out, and we really didn't get into uh, that much detail, uh, as Judge Kirby said, uh, the uh, witnesses who are called, many of them are, uh, uh, can be seen on the internet. Uh, if you've not read uh, the commission's report, it is, uh, uh, even for those of us who have heard this kind of thing for a long time, it, it, it's staggering really to read. Uh, but there are those who say now that uh, what you've found and reported on and, and written so eloquently uh, really renders any engagement with, with North Korea almost immoral. Now, I happen to know uh, that I think if I'm not mistaken, you all would disagree with that premise. And I wonder, maybe Ambassador King is the U.S. Uh, uh, representative here. Can you explain, first of all, am I right, uh, that you would disagree with that premise? And if so, why? Uh, one of the problems with trying to come up with solutions to a place like North Korea. If you get a little closer to your microphone, that'd be great. One of the problems with uh, dealing with an issue like North Korea is trying to suggest that there's a silver bullet or there's only one solution, that uh, we have to do one thing ra uh, in order to make progress. Uh, I would argue there are a lot of things that we need to do and that some of them are contradictory and that what we need to do is on the one hand what we refer to as naming and shaming. We need to identify human rights violations. We need to call attention to them. Uh, and we need to do what Judge Kirby has done so extremely well. Uh, this, uh, the work that the Commission of Inquiry has done has been extremely important. Uh, and what has been done is also groundbreaking in many regards. The, uh, the way the report has been done, the way it's been put on the web, and you 
you have uh, video and you have transcripts of, of the sessions that were held. And the quality of the report that was produced is something that is truly outstanding. It sets a new standard for commissions of inquiry uh, in the United Nations system. And I think this is, this is in, in large part due to Judge Kirby and the other two members of the commission who worked with him. But what they have done is put pressure on North Korea, and there's no question that the North Koreans feel pressure. Uh, the North Koreans uh, today, in fact, came out with a detailed uh, condemnation of the United States for its human rights record. Uh, the North Koreans have uh, suddenly started including uh, pressure on North Korea for what we are, uh, you know, for our right to develop nuclear weapons and for our human rights. Uh, you know, the fact that the North Koreans seem to be catching the fact that they're under criticism has been extremely helpful. And so that's one thing we need to do. It's not all we need to do. There is value and merit in engaging the North Koreans. And the things that Kati Zervilig uh, talks about uh, and the kind of things that NGOs and the United Nations do in terms of working with the North Koreans are something that we also need to do. Uh, in terms of showing the North Koreans what Americans are like, there's probably no better example than the American NGOs who go into North Korea and who are engaged in terms of trying to improve health conditions, trying to improve food and uh, nutrition, uh, to, uh, trying to improve education. So that we have to do that as well. So, I mean, engagement is part of what needs to be done. Uh, another thing that we need to do is try to increase the flow of information that goes in. Mr. Lee talked about the value of North Koreans having information. We need to continue to broadcast into North Korea. Uh, North Korea is one of the few places left on Earth where people actually get news from listening to the radio. Uh, you don't have access to the Internet. Uh, you know, there is a radio, and, and radio actually works. Uh, there are uh, broadcasts uh, into North Korea from South Korea. There are broadcasts in Korean uh, from China, which reach North Korea. The United States uh, puts considerable resources into broadcasting. Do we reach them? It's estimated that based on interviews with uh, North Koreans who have left uh, North Korea and are now in South Korea and elsewhere, uh, somewhere around 30 percent of North Koreans listen regularly, not every day, but regularly to foreign radio broadcasts. About a third of those listen to Chinese, Korean language broadcasts, a third to South Korean broadcasts, a third to American broadcasts. So there is isn't an effect, there is an impact. Uh, it is illegal and has been illegal for a long time to watch South Korean soap operas. I don't know how many of you have watched South Korean soap operas. They're incredibly good. Uh, the, the, I haven't spent a lot of time watching them. The production values are high. The stories are good. The pictures of Seoul tell you something about what South Korea is like. And what you find is that 80 percent of North Koreans have seen South Korean soap operas. Uh, now, uh, this is DVDs. There's a risk, uh, as, as you learn from Mr. Lee, in terms Don't of get doing them that. stuck in your DVD machine, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they do it on purpose. And, but nonetheless, information is getting in. We need to continue to push and press in terms of encouraging flow of information. There are increasing numbers of Chinese who are coming in and out of North Korea. They bring information with them. They leave information when they go. There are increasing numbers of North Koreans who are allowed to go to China legally to work, uh, to carry on trade and other activities. They are getting information and they're in increasing the flow of information. So these are things that we need to continue continue to do. So there are a whole range of things like that that we need to continue to encourage in terms of trying to have an impact in terms of making a change in what happens. So you've put a lot on the table. I do want to come back to the, the, the question I posed to you, to, to Ambassador Chun. So um, one of the very specific arguments that was made as a direct result of Judge Kirby's report uh, came in the form of, uh, of an editorial in the Wall Street Journal here. And it basically, the title was Never Again. And it ran through a litany of uh, all these areas that could just be described as forms of engagement, uh, including the kind of international engagement uh, that you've been involved with uh, uh, in the multi-party talks, but just also, you know, no more aid, uh, no free pass for China. We get into that later. But what's your reaction when you hear arguments like that? Well, um, 
Mm. You know, I've been a practitioner of engagement for four years. I spent four years of my career negotiating with North Koreans. So uh, I don't want to uh, get into uh, self-denial <laughs> for myself. So I think engagement should be part of the toolbox in dealing with North Korea. And I, I don't think there should be an either-or approach between engagement and, and pressure or whatever you call it. We need sanctions. Sanctions have their own purposes. We have engagement to foster positive changes in North Korea. I think that's the best way. There are other ways, but we cannot think about uh, promoting positive changes without engagement. But engagement without strengthening North Korea's capabilities, financial capabilities, to sustain international pressure for denuclearization, that's very important. We cannot just uh, engage in a way that can enhance their capabilities to resist uh, international pressure for, de for denuclearization. That would be the most dangerous kind of engagement. But without uh, involving massive financial flows into North Korea, I think uh, changing North Korea in a positive way, that should be a, an important long-term goal. And to the extent that engagement serves that purpose, I see uh, necessity for that. But uh, I think what uh, Judge Kirby has done as uh, chair of the uh, International uh, Commission of Inquiry was to put human rights, North Korean human rights, uh, onto global agenda and it, its rightful place and made it an important tool uh, in not only in pressuring North Korea, but in, in promoting change in North Korea. In that regard, I, I really appreciate his achievement. And uh, coming back to what uh, 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 Ambassador King said, I think, yeah, I, I, I fully w agree with him on the, on the role of information. While North Korea is uh, now facing an existential crisis, I think the most, the, the, the most dangerous enemy of the North Korean regime is the truth about themselves, truth about the outside world. And one encouraging development uh, in recent years is that uh, uh, although North Korea doesn't have a, a vaccine uh, to protect themselves from this virus uh, hmm. called truth, uh, we have uh, now better means to to uh, send information, the truth, into North Korea. I think uh, uh, Ambassador King has done uh, a great job in promoting broadcast into North Korea because North Koreans have now better means. They don't have just uh, fixed fr uh, frequencies for their radios. They, have, they can listen to South Korean, t uh, watch South Korean TVs, not all of them, but listen to South Korean radio. So they cannot prevent this kind of... Uh, uh, a creeping information, truth into North Korea with their nuclear weapons. No, no, nuclear weapons do not serve any purpose in preventing, in, in keeping out uh, the truth from outside the world. So I think the, the truth, the amount of truth that North Korean people will get access to will be, uh, I think, the most important determinant of North Korea's fate in the coming years. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you've talked now about engagement and pressure. From your experience as as a diplomat and, a, and an interlocutor, a negotiator, what um, if you can speak a little bit to the danger sometimes of overt serious pressure on the North? I know, I know you've just argued for it in a way, but uh, there are some who who say that um, uh, that that pressure of a certain kind can affect exactly the kind of behavior we don't want to see happen. What do you think of that argument? Well, we have, uh, I don't know if uh, there has been uh, enough pressure to worry about that kind of situation in North Korea. I think uh, uh, many countries, uh, I know the Security Council has been trying very hard to, to impose sanctions on North Korea in response to their uh, missile test, their uh, uh, nuclear testing, but if you compare the sanctions in place with North Korea, with those in Iran, with Iran, which is not yet developing nuclear weapons, they are developing the capabilities they can use to make nuclear weapons at a, at a later stage. 
The sanctions on Iran are comprehensive. They touch on all major avenues of uh, uh, earnings, foreign currency earnings, uh, gas, oil, construction, finance, shipping, everything that uh, is very important in Iran's economy. But most of them have nothing to do with their enrichment program. But with North Korea, this is, uh, this is I think, pro forma, toothless sanctions. Mm. So, uh, but those countries who decide to impose sanctions, they try to, you know, to pretend that they are really uh, taking, uh, biting sanctions. But the sanctions in place do not really bite North Korea now. That's why North Korea can afford to, to, uh, to defy uh, the advice of, of uh, the international community, admonition of China to, for, for restraint in their uh, nuclear activities. So uh, I don't think the, the sanctions are working now. So if we are going to, uh, unless we can um, restructure North Korea's strategic calculus in a way that would favor denuclearization, uh, I see the the current sanctions will will not uh, will not be enough to change North Korean behavior, their calculus. Okay, uh, Judge Kirby, if we can come back to you for a moment. You you uh, your report says in one of its conclusions that the world quote must accept its responsibility to protect the North Korean people, and you said today on the earlier panel that it's a call for international action, and. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on what you mean by that, because that sounds like, uh, uh, you know, a, a fairly invasive approach from the outside world. But you're you're not against certain of the sanctions that uh, have been put in place, as you said earlier. What's the call for international action that action that you think is is most appropriate? Well, I, I agree with what uh, Mr. Chun and uh, Ambassador King have said which is perhaps a sign why you should always have a woman on a panel because you're, <laughs> you're going to get a slight counterpoint to the uh, points that are put by men in suits. And I, I think that was a real strength of our previous panel. I fear that we're all going to be ad idem. We're going to agree on most things. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's not at all invasive to say that there has to be action. International law says... If you find that there is a believable testimony of crimes against humanity, there is a responsibility to protect. Uh, and the, uh, if the country itself will not respond to uh, crimes against humanity, then it is the duty of the international community to step in and protect the people of the country who are suffering from crimes against humanity. Crimes against humanity under international law are not just your ordinary breaches of uh, universal human rights. Australia, the United States and South Korea have plenty of breaches of human rights and we have our different ways of dealing with them, including in our courts, with our, under our constitutions and laws and also in the uh, Human Rights uh, Council uh, uh, in Geneva. But... Crimes against humanity are very serious international crimes which involve state policy uh, of um, very grave uh, violence against people uh, and this is what the Commission of Inquiry has found. So if we don't do anything about it, then what's all this talk about putting human rights up front and about the responsibility to protect uh, if when you are presented with the testimony... Uh, nothing is done. Now, it is true that things have begun to happen. Um, last week, there was announced in uh, South Korea that uh, the government of South Korea, at the intervention of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights, following up a recommendation of the Commission of Inquiry, uh, has agreed to the establishment of a field office so there is going to be a permanent legacy of the Commission of Inquiry. It's going to be set up uh, in uh, South Korea. It's going to continue getting the testimony of witnesses, which will be available when in due time 
uh, there can be um, some form of prosecution before an international tribunal. Uh, now, that was a sensitive matter. Uh, and when I had the privilege last Friday to uh, be received by President Park at the Blue House in Seoul, uh, one abiding lesson that she left with me was a lesson which is relevant to this session. She said that she would like assistance on how you can get reunification, but at the same time stand up for universal human rights. And this is the quandary, I think. This is the quandary that uh, agitates mm -hmm. everybody from the president down uh, in South Korea, and it is a legitimate question. How can you get human rights uh, if you're saying that these actions are just uncivilised and they have to stop now? And there is a duty of the international community to protect people from them. Uh, will that undermine the moves for reunification, which many Koreans believe, if only we can get reunification, then a lot of these problems will melt away. And that's probably right. But the real issue is, how can you get reunification by turning a blind eye, by turning the other cheek, by not speaking, by being silent... Is that a foundation for a unification which would be stable, which would respect the human rights of the people of uh, North Korea, or is that a reunification only on the terms of North Korea, which would include the term of the ruling family, uh, the deification or semi-deification of the, uh, not only now of Kim Il-sung, but Kim Jong-il, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the elite, which has such a, a hold on North Korea. So uh, this is the quandary, and it's one of the reasons, I think, that young people in, uh, in, uh, North, in, in South Korea feel a bit disinclined to engage with this issue. Sure. It's just too difficult. On the one hand, they know that you have to stand up and speak out against human rights abuses of the variety, duration and severity of the kind that the Commission of Inquiry has now revealed to the whole world. But on the other hand, the fear is that if you do that, that is going to make unification more difficult to achieve. And it is the real quandary that this panel has to grapple with. And there are no magic bullets, there's no magic solution, but it is not a solution to stop talking about human rights. Human rights is our common heritage as human beings. And if we stop talking about those, then the whole point of the Charter and the Universal Declaration, the whole, all of the achievements since 1945 San Francisco are just thrown out. And that cannot be a term uh, of dealing with North Korea or any other human rights abuser. And this is one of the greatest abusers of human rights in the world. So silence... As they say in HIV, silence is death. Silence is not an option, and we can't therefore embrace it. But again, beyond the need for words and talking, you've, you've issued this call for action, and perhaps this is the quandary for the international community you're talking about. The, the, the language that you just used at the beginning of your, your answer to that question about crimes against humanity, that sort of language has been used by this country and others to go in with, with armed force uh, to rectify a situation or attempt to do so, to remove people. Uh, and, and, and I would say in most of those cases that I'm thinking of anyway, the, the evidence was, was far weaker than the evidence presented in your report. And I invite anybody on the panel to address that question. Well, it's, it's true that uh, crimes against humanity have sometimes been alleged in the past. Uh, and, of course, there's, we were not prosecutors. We were not judges. And we were, we were simply saying this is a foundation on which a prosecution could be legitimately brought in the case. And there was plenty of evidence to justify that conclusion. So... Uh, what, what are we to do? Are we simply to uh, do nothing, turn a blind eye and turn away from this? Or are we to say, well, we, 
we must continue to gather the testimony and there's the reason for this field office. The UN is going to have people on the ground in South Korea this week, I think, or next week. So it's moving very quickly on on this matter. And I think it's important to say to you that in the Human Rights Council, when the vote came, there were only six countries that voted against mm -hmm. the, pro the proposals and the, the spirit of our report. They were China, the Russian Federation, Vietnam, uh, Venezuela, Cuba and Pakistan. They were the countries that voted against. And every country which had been a member of the Soviet bloc, including Kazakhstan, voted in favour of the, of the report. And so many of the ambassadors of the former Soviet bloc came up to us after the vote was taken and when it was all done and, and finished in, in Geneva. And they said to us, don't you ever think, because it will take time to get action, don't you think that this has been a waste of effort? Mm. Because we went through this I'm thinking of the ambassador of Albania, the ambassador of the Czech Republic, the ambassador for um, for Macedonia, the ambassadors in the room who had been through that. They said, we never went through as bad as it is in North Korea, but what you have done is to give dignity to the people who have been complaining. It is part of the history of the Korean people that you have recorded that is now on the record and in due course of time there will be a, an answer to this. There will be accountability for this and you have laid down the, the history which will be there for future generations of the Korean people and above all you have shown that the UN stepped up to the plate uh, this is one case where the UN has done everything it should have done. It set up the inquiry, it funded it properly, it set up the commission correctly, uh, it, it guarded its independence, it respected our right to make our own investigation and then it brought forward the recommendations and it's acting quickly on those that it can deal with itself. Well, it's good to hear a little yes. bit of applaud for you. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're all accustomed to being a little bit cynical about aspects yeah. of the United Nations, but really this is a case where with a very high degree of, of unanimity, the United Nations, our commission of inquiry was set up without a vote. We were the only commission of inquiry that was being set up without a vote because the international community, I think, is fed up. Uh, yep. But there remains the puzzle that President Park referred to. How do you encourage unification, which is the goal that uh, all Koreans have, including in the North, but how do, you, uh, how do you advance it otherwise than on the terms of the ruling family uh, in a way that will guard the human rights of the people of Korea? That is the quandary. Uh, and it it may take time, but it shouldn't take too much time because in the meantime, fundamental human rights are being grossly abused. So can we ask Ambassador Chun, and actually both of you have very interesting perspectives on exactly that question, to, to balance the uh, your call for pressure and ready, against this need to be sure or uh, to guard against a very, very messy situation that could unfold if you don't bear in mind uh, um, what, what, what Judge Kirby's talking about, uh, that, that chances for reunification uh, could go south and that the real fear of a collapse uh, um, if things are pushed too fast. Well, um, if... Um Judge Kirby was uh, slightly disappointed at the lack of enthusiasm among the South Korean young people, um, you know, on uh, North Korean human rights situation. Uh, I can only explain to him that um, that uh, the Republic of Korea, not only the young people but the Korean people, are divided mm -hmm. on what should be our right North Korea policy. There are uh, important. Uh, elements in the South Korean society who believe that whatever wrong North Korea does, whatever crimes against humanity they commit, they should be forgiven because they are North Koreans. This is a totalitarian regime and this is, this is inherent in their, the, the nature of the regime. So we shouldn't just uh, try to apply the 
standards of the civilized world uh, with North Korea. There's an, another is uh, many young Koreans. They have they have uh, seen North Korea the way it is for for all their life, and they take it you know, not uh, for them. It's just the fact of life they have been living with uh, for for their entire life. So there's nothing new. So there's no real sense of urgency to rectify that kind of situation in North Korea. And I I, I understand that you, as fellow compatriots, you know, we shouldn't be more enthusiastic than you are in resolving the problems of our own own nation. And, um, but uh, I don't see any contradiction between the goal of unification and human rights because you know, unification is not just to unify the territory or just to alleviate poverty in North Korea. I think the, the highest value that we expect to achieve through unification is to enable North Korean people, our 25 million North Korean compatriots, to uh, enjoy uh, dignity of life, opportunities to, to, uh, to live more humane life. And I think the, the human rights is among the most important goals of unification. So I think in terms of goals, um, I see no contradiction uh, between unification and, and human rights. But uh, since we don't have any female <laughs> member in the uh, panel, we better get one, one thing <laughs> to act as more engagement rotor uh, um, here, um, one thing that uh, will relate to uh, to denuclearization is that North Koreans have North Korean Korean government has been arguing that we are developing nuclear weapons to protect ourselves against U.S. hostile policy and or U.S. led hostile policy. You know, I think they see the human rights. Commission report as part of a broader U.S.-led hostile policy against North Korea to strangle, to as part of a strategy to strangle North Korea into collapse. That's their perception, and as you know, the perception is also reality in, mm -hmm. in national security policy. And if you look at uh, uh, that part of the perception, uh, there is a danger that North Korea will cling more desperately to. To their nuclear armament, and they will feel that uh, you know the hostile policy is now becoming stronger, and we have nuclear weapons are the only means we can protect ourselves against the the broader, more active hostile policy against our sacred, our sacrosanct regime and our our uh, holy leader. So, uh, so I don't know how that will uh, affect. Uh, the efforts to denuclearize North Korea. I, I think there will be pros and cons. But uh, coming back to the, the role of sanctions, what I uh, didn't say was that I'm not, a, I'm not a fan of sanctions. And I don't believe that sanctions are panacea in resolving our humanitarian uh, human rights problem or denuclearization, anything. But uh, the reason that um, uh, we need... Uh, uh, when the sanctions is, as I said, that's, that's helpful in changing the strategic calculus of North Korea because they are not paying a price for their nuclear armament now. Not enough, enough uh, uh, price to change their calculations. So uh, without changing that calculations, uh, whatever we do to, to denuclearize North Korea will not work. And it's the same with, uh, I think... Uh, uh, pressure on uh, on human rights. Uh, I think one merit of that is uh, that you can keep the possibility of getting Kim Jong Un to stand on trial in ISIS International uh, Criminal Court for um, any uh, acts that he might. And he is committing, uh, and in terms of the uh, 
the uh, uh, crimes against humanity. And because this is a theocracy, theocracy, I think uh, uh, the open discussion about their holy leader, the, the Ayatollah of the theocracy, standing on trial, internet trial, that will be a great shock regardless of the threat perceptions I have. I think that will be uh, very embarrassing for the loyal subjects of, uh, of the regime. And um, I think that will... Uh, we we have to make sure that 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 uh, works in the way of uh, fostering uh, changes in North Korean regime. Ambassador King, do you want to say anything either on that point, or uh, I was reminded as Ambassador Chun was saying that perceptions of what the United States is all about vis-a-vis -vis Korea. I have to imagine that when they uh, saw six, seven years ago that we had decided to have a United States ambassador for human rights in North Korea. I don't know if we have one for any other country. That can't have been <laughs> a, a perception that was uh, very positive there. Um, do, do you have a reaction to anything Ambassador Chun said? or uh, any? Wh how do you work, if at all, to try to counter perceptions in North Korea about this country? Because it's well known that they view us uh, uh, through a prism that is warped, but as Ambassador Chun said, perception is reality. Uh, with my title as the Special Envoy for North Korea Human Rights, I'm going to step outside of that <laughs> particular box and say when one is looking at the issues of how do you deal with human rights in North Korea, it becomes a much more complicated issue. Uh, one talks about the, the possibility of uh, unification leading to an improvement in the human rights situation, but the complexity becomes how do you deal with China? What is China's reaction to Korean unification? Uh, the northeast of China is a relatively undeveloped area, but it's an area the Chinese are concerned about. Uh, in the last little while, uh, talking in centuries, not days, uh, the Chinese have uh, found themselves invaded up the Korean Peninsula and into Manchuria. And what happens in Korea and what happens in North Korea in particular is a real concern mm -hmm. to what the Chinese uh, are going to want to do. What are they going to want to see in terms of Korean unification? Uh, there's all kinds of uh, discussion about what the possibilities are in terms of uh, would, would they accept Korean unification if the United States stayed below the third gate parallel, if the United States withdrew troops. Uh, these are issues that are fairly serious and, and not easily resolved. And when you look at the question of how do we deal with North Korea's nuclear weapons, we need China. We need China's help. What we have done with sanctions in Iran is go after the sources of income for Iran. It's oil, it's gas, and it's how do they get the oil and gas out so people will buy it. And so we've cut off, we've tried to cut off, we've tried to discourage purchases of, of oil and gas from, from Iran. We've made it tough. They can't buy equipment. We won't sell them equipment to improve their extraction of oil and gas and so forth. We're dealing with the same kind of problem with North Korea. How do you stop North Korea from developing or further developing nuclear weapons, improving its nuclear weapons, uh, improving the, the capability of delivering those weapons? You've got to cut off the sources of funds and you've got to cut off the sources of the resources that are necessary to develop those weapons. And where is that coming from? Well, quite frankly, right now, most of it is coming from China. Uh, North Korea is primarily, uh, at least recently, uh, heavily dependent on China. The Chinese economy is uh, where North Korean coal goes, where North Korean resources of one kind or another go, increasingly where North Korean labor is, is being uh, utilized. And the sources of funding that are coming into North Korea are coming primarily through China. At the same time, the kinds of equipment that's necessary to improve nuclear weapons are coming from China. We have got to have the support and the help of China if we're going to deal with North Korea. And the difficulty there is how do we 
keep the Chinese on board? How do we make progress in terms of, of dealing with the North Koreans? Uh, and how far do we want to go? Uh, one of the issues that we are looking at uh, is the question of a referral uh, of North Korea to the International Criminal Court. Uh, based on the excellent work that the Commission of Inquiry has done. Uh, it's not just a question of referring. This is an action that the Security Council would take. Uh, it would require a vote, uh, action of the Security Council to make a referral to the International Criminal Court. What would happen if this issue came up before the, criminal, uh, before the Security Council. Uh, Russia has a veto. China has a veto. Both of them have voted in the past to support North Korea. We could raise the issue in the Security Council, but would we get a yes vote? Probably not. Now, there may be some virtue and value in doing what we've done uh, on Ukraine. We forced a vote to the Security Council on the actions that were taking place in Ukraine, and the Soviet Union was forced to, to vote against it, to veto it, even though the majority of the Security Council voted the other way. If we were to have a vote in the Security Council on North Korean human rights, we'd probably do very well. There was, uh, in New York, uh, uh, with, uh, with Judge Kirby just a couple of, uh, just a month and a half ago, a uh, Security Council informal meeting. Fifteen members of the Security Council. We had 13 members in attendance at this informal session where the presentation was made by the Commission of Inquiry, where the issues were discussed. Eleven of the 13 members were there, spoke, and specifically praised the Commission of Inquiry and called for action to move in the right direction. The two countries that were not there were China and Russia. Do you force this issue to the Security Council at the risk of alienating China in terms of dealing with North Korea on a lot of other issues? The Chinese are not terribly happy with North Korea. Uh, it doesn't do them any good to see North Korea having nuclear weapons. Uh, and nuclear weapons, they don't really fear that they're going to be used against China. Uh, but they have certainly forced some of the neighbors to be very concerned about what's going on. Uh, there's a much stronger emphasis on uh, military cooperation in Japan now. Uh, and part of that is what's going on in terms of North Korea. So it, it becomes a real question of how do we deal with China? How do we make progress in terms of dealing with nuclear issues? How do we deal with problems relating to human rights? And how do we mesh them and make them all work? And it's not an easy kind of an issue. The other thing that I want to make one comment about that's somewhat unrelated but I think is important because it hasn't really been explicitly said is the importance of the relationship between the United States and South Korea. South Korea is the country that is most impacted by what happens in North Korea. If there is military action, South Korea is going to suffer by far the largest burden. We have a very close and a very cordial and a very cooperative relationship with South Korea. We work with them in a whole range of issues, but we've worked with them very closely on the human rights issues involving North Korea. We've worked with them very closely on the military issues involving North Korea. And so we've got an issue there to deal with in terms of improving that relationship and recognizing that there are issues at stake here that for us are important but for South Korea are really important. And it's a process of how do you deal with all of these conflicting pressures and, and issues and come up with the kind of solution that will move us in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I, I've just been handed a packet of questions that are probably far better than most of my own, so I'm going to just ask a couple more myself and then get to them. Um, I, I did want to come back to the, because uh, now we've, we've, the discussion has wandered back, I think, from engagement over to pressure again, uh, particularly with your last remarks. But there was so much discussion on the first panel. I frankly was a little surprised about, uh, you know, it became a fairly optimistic panel, considering that the genesis of the discussion was your not at all optimistic report. So I want to come back to those straws in the wind, or what Ms. Zellweger referred to as her five M's, I think. Um, all of them somewhat positive in the slight opening uh, on the economic front, um, 
we at the Asia Society had heard, and I'm not at liberty to share who these delegations were, it doesn't much matter, but from a couple of delegations who've been in relatively recently who both came back having heard very uh, sort of full-throated requests. They remind me a little bit of what uh, Ms. Zellweger said about this notion of, of helping with business school training in the North, uh, where they're really looking for interlocutors or um, advice, at least, on foreign investment in different ways. Um, that seems to me to be another straw in the wind. Um, all the, uh, is it Jun Meng Dung, forgive my Korean, the, the, the black market and this access to information. So taking all that, and it may not amount to that much, but uh, I, I was in the Soviet Union all those years ago when we were just starting to have straws in the wind there. What should the diplomatic, the international diplomatic response be uh, on the engagement side, to be sure that we capture what little momentum exists with straws in the wind like that. How, I mean, it seems to me that uh, if you're looking to break a bottleneck in some way, there needs to be uh, an international response that at least acknowledges that there are these little wisps of something going on. I'd start with you, Ambassador Chun. I think it's important to encourage, um, as I said, uh, changes, positive changes in North Korea. I think one way to engage without strengthening North Korea's financial capabilities um, to retain their nuclear capabilities is uh, in the area of human context and education. I think it's a good thing to uh, establish business schools in North Korea. I think it's before you establish business schools, I think it's more important to teach English to the North Koreans. <laughs> train North Korean English teachers because that's the way they can have an access to outside information, not in Korean only. So I think uh, investing in education in North Korea, even uh, you know, giving scholarships to North Korean teachers and you know, engineers, North Koreans in the U.S. or Australia, anywhere, I think that's a good thing. That, I think that will be a driver of positive change in North Korea. Any kind of human context, and the more human context, the more the better to show the North Korean people that there, is, there exists different kind of world. Mm -hmm. And they can have more information about outside the world. That's, that's I think, the right kind of engagement. And we, we should do everything to encourage. When it comes to, so I think that's a very important thing. I think the expanding market what you, you, uh, your pronunciation was not that bad. Chang Madang is the right <laughs> pronunciation, but I think most Koreans um, uh, understood what you meant. So uh, I think Chang Madang expanding, expanding, <laughs> whether it's illegal or legal, you know, uh, expanding market is important because North Korean people, they can depend less on the handouts of the government. Mm -hmm. So the state control will weaken to the extent that. Uh, the, the markets expand. Mm -hmm. That's how we can uh, foster uh, pluralism within North Korea. Because now this is totalitarian society and you know, allocation system uh, will control the, the material life of North Korean people. But with expansion of uh, markets, I think everything uh, is changing. And another is the polarization of income. When you have a business, mm -hmm. markets, you know, North Korean uh, uh, theocracy believes in equality of people. But now, with the corruption and markets, you know, free enterprise in the markets, that uh, makes North Korea among the most polarized in income distribution in the world. I think more so than in China. So these... Socialist countries, namely socialist countries, they are, I think, income disparity between the rich and poor is widening. That's also an important virus that will uh, destroy the credibility of the regime. So, but I think when it comes to FDI, foreign direct investment, um, if, if it involves massive economic uh, cash flows, I think that's something we can uh, put off until we see some positive signs on North Korea's uh, denuclearization because that's, as I said, that could uh, 
uh, have an impact in opening up the North Korean society. But on the other hand, uh, that would also strengthen North Korea's capability to resist international pressure mm -hmm. for denuclearization. So we, if you balance the, the, the both sides, uh, I'm concerned about uh, the negative aspect of uh, a large-scale foreign direct investment. And since the risk of investment in North Korea is higher than elsewhere, anywhere else in the world, I don't think there are, there are any Chinese companies who are ready. I know they, are, they will be more willing to put their money in casino rather than, than in North Korea. But, but, uh, but if North Korea changes the system, I think if, if they change their uh, legal system, uh, the, you know, they, they uh, you know, provide for the system of protecting foreign investments in a more credible way, there can be more investments in North mm -hmm. Korea. But uh, I think that's not something we would encourage at this point. Mm -hmm. Judge Kirby, how would you respond to some, uh, well, some of these economists little glimmers of hope? and corporations will make their economic decisions uh, prudently, and it seems very unlikely to me that they're going to want to spend a lot of money in a country uh, whose legal system is uh, of the kind that we saw recently with uh, Jang Sung Tech. Uh, and therefore, I think that can really be left to them to work out. The big challenge is whether we let diplomats uh, run away with this issue as if they should have the last word. You'd expect me, uh, as a lawyer, as a judge of 34 years and as the chair of the Commission of Inquiry, to put in a bid for human rights. Human rights is something that belongs to us as human beings. It is not something that should just be on the table and negotiated away in dark uh, rooms, what we used to call smoke-filled rooms. They're not smoke-filled now, but they could still be diplomats getting together and saying, well, we won't be too nasty here because we'd be throwing away our effort with China on this and it's not going to help us. China has been extremely prudent in the use of the veto in the United Nations. China, ha since the PRC has occupied the China seat, it's only used the veto uh, on 10 occasions. One, one of the 10 was only two weeks ago in Syria. Uh, but uh, it, China doesn't like to be forced. It's not a very Chinese sort of thing to do to use the veto. Uh, but uh, And Russia, of course, is now largely disengaged. China, uh, uh, North Korea is not a Syria for Russia. Mm. Uh, since the end of the uh, Soviet Union, Russia's, uh, the Russian Federation's engagement with North Korea is not as uh, close or as intimate. A and so I wouldn't at all put off the possibility that something may come of discussion in the Security Council, just as it did with the sanctions. Uh, w what I'm thinking of is not so much an entirely new resolution, but something added on to the resolution that already exists right. because of the fact that human rights are interconnected with peace and security. If you have a regime which is so unstable that the second or third most powerful man in the land can be disposed of in that humiliating and brutal way, then it's not business as usual. This is not how it was run in the time of uh, Kim uh, Jong-il. Um, so uh, what concerns me is when our report came out, the UN Commission of Inquiry, uh, it was the number one story for more than a day on the BBC. It was the number one story for more than a day on Al Jazeera. It was the number one story on CNN. It was the number five story on South Korea media. Now, why is that? Uh, it, it is because of this quandary that lies at the heart of the future of the Koreas. And that's why when I went there last week, uh, I asked, could I see the president? And I had the honour to meet the president, who was very thoughtful in her remarks and very impressive, I might say. Uh, but uh, I asked to see a lot of young people. So I saw lots of university students and school students. And they are engaged, but of course they're worried. They are the, on the border. They're the ones who are close to the nuclear warheads and it's understandable that they should be worried. All I can say is I don't think the solution for the security or the human rights is going to be silence. Uh, that was tried. Um, just before uh, Kim Dae-jong became the president 
a most admirable man. He walked twice to the gallows for his belief in human rights and was saved at the last minute. He was an amazing man and I met him in Australia, had him to my chambers in the High Court of Australia. I was proud to meet him. But it has to be said that uh, the Sunshine Policy did not deliver... Mm. A lot of money was spent, a lot of energy, a lot of persuasion, uh, all the efforts. Uh, the, the Kim Dae-jong went up there. Everything was done that could have been done. And did it deliver uh, anything on human rights? Not really. Did Kim Dae-jong speak, uh, uh, Je- De speak about human rights during that time? No, he didn't. No. And so... Uh, you really have to face this recalcitrant country mm-hmm. and ask yourself, if silence does not deliver, what can be done and what should be done? Should we just turf human rights that belong to the people of North Korea out or should we continue lifting our voice and saying no reunification can possibly be achieved without fundamental change inside North Korea to respect the human rights of the people. And that's what the Commission of Inquiry has urged. And uh, you would expect me to say this. My job is to speak for human rights. But I think it's also uh, speaking for the geopolitics of the situation. If you, otherwise, it's just wishful, wishful thinking, living in a dream world. And that is not going to advance either the geopolitics or the human rights in North Korea. May I comment quickly? Because I do have to keep okay. to my word and get okay. to I'm, I'm not a, as optimistic as uh, Judge Kirby on the chance of uh, getting uh, you know, support or, uh, or even acquiescence from China and Russia when it comes to a vote in the Security Council. Well, it depends on the, the contents of the resolution or yes. presidential statement. But uh, I think for two reasons, uh, not just because not just because this is North Korean issue, I think they are China. Even when it comes to the moment of truth on Security Council resolution, uh, they wouldn't mind. I know that they are unhappy with what North Korea is doing with their nuclear development. They are not happy with the way that North Korean leadership defies China's advice. But they. Uh, uh, will be happy also to become an apologist for North Korea when it comes to condemning North Korea, to uh, acting against North Korea. And they have their own problem, China and Russia. Both of them uh, don't like uh, discussion of their own, the human rights in their own country. So they have been, they have been secu- uh, not, uh, human rights council resolutions on human rights situation in Russia and China. And they have the uh, position of opposing any human rights resolution on individual country as a matter of principle. So, and they would be worried that something of that kind could come to them, not now, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept any possibility that well, same thing can be applied to, to China when something goes wrong there or for, by, for political uh, objectives by the West. And I think Russia will feel, I don't know how they can resist temptation to do anything that could uh, embarrass the U.S. when the U.S. is taking sanctions o- over uh, Crimea. Or that's a very good China. point. That's, I think that will be very, whenever they have a chance, I don't yes, think they, they, will, they, they will miss it. They can use their veto. Yeah. No one doubts that they'll use it to protect themselves. But I'm with Ambassador King the way the Charter was expected to operate under the Dumbarton Oaks Compromise was the great powers have the veto, but let them exercise it before the people of the Mm. United Nations in whose name the United Nations was set up in this city. Uh, Let it not be backroom deals that take it off the agenda. Let it be before the people of the United Nations and also before the pages of history. Already in China, bloggers are saying, why is our country, Mm -hmm. why is our country supporting this rogue regime? And why is it supporting such gross abuses of human rights? Once information starts spreading, people begin to ask those questions. One thing that I want to... Yeah, yeah, okay. (laughs) I know you... uh, uh, One of the things that I think we have to be careful of here is is silver silver bullet syndrome. 
there isn't one solution to dealing with the human rights problem in North Korea. And the idea that, that we can do it either by engagement or that we can do it by taking it to the UN Security Council. Going to the Security Council will put pressure on North Korea. It will embarrass North Korea. It will put pressure on the Chinese. It will embarrass the Chinese if they have to veto it or if they don't veto it. Uh, but that in and of itself is not going to solve the problem. The North Koreans are not members of the International Criminal Court. A referral will not solve the problem. We've got to move on and continue to do all kinds of things. We've got to engage, but that isn't enough. We've got to increase information, but that alone is not enough. Uh, we've got to do all kinds of things in terms of making progress, continuing pressure, uh, continuing everything that we can do, and continue that whole effort. Yes, we've got to do everything we can, but we can't expect that any one of them is going to solve the problem for us because it won't. That's a very good segue to a question from the audience. So, and if we can keep the answers brief, and any one of you who want to jump in, uh, what does success look like for the international community in five years? Short of human rights violations all stopping, can we define a realistic measurement of success that is achievable and acceptable? Step by step, starting with the setting up of this uh, new uh, field base in South Korea, um, which was a sensitive decision for South Korea to take, but it has been agreed. It's being set up, and the UN is again moving with all due speed to. But have five that years from now, what would be a metric of, of success that you'd love to come back here and speak to us again and say, I'm so proud that this has happened? Well, I'll come back in five years then. <laughs> <laughs> I'll always come back to San Francisco. Uh, I think we will see uh, more changes. It's a bit like Victor Cha at the end of his book. Um, uh, impossible state. He says, the very last uh, paragraph, if uh, I come back in 20 years and North Korea is still there, I will not be surprised. If I come back in 20 years and North Korea has changed out of all recognition, I will not mm. be surprised. And I think sort of speculating on what will happen is beyond our capacity. All we can do is what Ambassador King has been so patiently endeavouring to do and what the Commission of Inquiry urged. People-to-people -people contact, little steps like the Asian Games, uh, medium steps like setting up a, an office in South Korea to continue the collection of the testimony of which there is plenty, uh, and big steps discussions in the Security Council. And uh, don't write that off. Mm -hmm. People would have written off the uh, sanctions uh, on um, weapons of war, but that was accepted. There are very clever people in the Security Council and they know this is a very great existential threat to humanity, to the human species we're talking about, as well as to the human rights of the people of North Korea. Either of you want to weigh in, or should we move on to the next question? Well said. No more speculation. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> here's some more speculation, or actually, uh, I'll, I'll try it. Is reunification of Korea conceivable without assuming the collapse of Kim's regime? Ambassador Chun. Well, if we can get that, that would be the best, the, the, the ideal thing to happen. But uh, uh, I don't think unification peaceful unification. That should remain our goal, our ideal. But I don't think that will become a reality. So uh, before North Korea collapses under the weight of its own failures, uh, I see no real chance of unification. But collapse of North Korean regime doesn't necessarily mean unification. I think there can be a successor regime that mm -hmm. takes over Kim Jong-un. And it will try to muddle through. But I think uh, the successor government, I would, I would be surprised if it can you know, stabilize the country and succeed in muddling through. And I think uh, once the successor government cannot control you know, the, the, the unleashing of the, the explosive energy from the rebellious people, and if the, the entire North Korean population, the entire country... It uh, gets into a, a, a chaos, and uh, we cannot avoid uh, a massive humanitarian disaster there. Uh, and unless international community or the ROK intervenes, you know, 
And if no other country is, uh, is trying to intervene and the only option to stabilize North Korea, to bring order and stability into North Korea is by military intervention. And that would be, I think, uh, uh, the, the first step toward unification. But mm. I don't think uh, peaceful unification is a good thing and we should never, forget, never give up that effort. But uh, uh, we shouldn't have an illusion that that would become the, okay. the, the reality. The Commission of Inquiry could never start from a premise of regime change right. because we were an organ, an agency of the United Nations and they are a member of the United Nations and we could not disrespect a member of the United Nations and say, well, they shouldn't be in their present form. So we had to start from the basis, if you are a member of the United Nations, if you sign on to these treaties, you have to conform to their fundamental obligations. However... Um, uh, as uh, has been suggested, there may be some steps that uh, clever people can conceive of. After all, it was the American founding fathers uh, who created the modern system of federal, federal government. Uh, it drives some people crazy. I mean, the uh, New Zealanders ultimately uh, disdained the very generous blandishment which Australia made to them to join us because they said we will not tolerate federal system of government. But you never know whether somewhere down the track some sort of federal administration under some basis acceptable to both sides could be worked out, at, at least perhaps as a staging post. Uh, but reunification is a deep felt goal amongst the Korean people and why wouldn't it be? They were united f f as a polity for more than a thousand years, probably two thousand years, uh, and then this line was drawn on the map in the State Department by Dean Rusk, who later became the Secretary of State. He was asked to do it. He just put it across the middle of it, and there it was. This is not a decision of the Korean people. This was by the victorious allies thinking that this is what we'll have as an interim measure, and it's proved rather more durable. Might be the first time that Australia and New Zealand's relationship has been compared to North and South Korea. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we, we're still getting over the, the yeah. shock of their, <laughs> of their uh, unwillingness um, to uh, we join have, us. We have one here that should probably go to Ambassador King. Isolating and, and sanctioning the DPRK has not prevented them from getting the bomb or induced regime change. What do we have to lose by engaging the leadership? This comes back to the question Tom Gold suggested we the provocative one about why not just going all the way on the engagement side and set aside the nuclear issue while we find some common ground. Strategic patience is not working. Why not? I mean, that was the, the question at the end of the last panel. I don't know if you heard that. Why not just drop everything, diplomatic relations? What do we have to lose? Part of the problem is the question of what, uh, what North Korea wants. I mean, North Korea right now, the regime in North Korea benefits from the United States. We are the hostile force which forces North Korea to bring together all the forces to fight us. Uh, and if they didn't have somebody out, if they didn't have an enemy, if they didn't have somebody that was, you know, trying to do them in, there would be little that would unite the North Koreans and force them to make the sacrifices that they're being asked to make. Uh, so I think there's a real problem here in terms of, of how the North Koreans see the United States. It's not like the North Koreans are trying to reach out and, and engage us and uh, trying to get General Motors and, uh, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, to come to Pyongyang. Uh, there, there's a real problem here in that you've got a regime that is hostile to the United States. Uh, now, we have spent a lot of effort and energy and time trying to impose sanctions on North Korea. We've imposed sanctions on North Korea, and yes, they've tested three nuclear weapons. They've tested uh, long-range missiles. The question is, if we hadn't done that, where would we be today? Uh, would the North Koreans uh, be only as, as far as they are now if we hadn't tried with all of the means and efforts that our diplomacy could muster uh, to try to cut off sources of income and uh, sources of uh, weapons? Uh, it was largely uh, due to the effort that we have uh, 
been leading, that North Korea is subject to, for example, what happened with the, uh, the ship that was uh, stopped in the Panama Canal. Uh, they had... Uh, Soviet MiGs that were in the process of being taken back to North Korea, apparently refurbished, so that they could be flown in, in North Korea and be used for their own uh, military purposes. Uh, if we hadn't imposed fairly stiff sanctions on North Korea, and if we hadn't had the cooperation of the Chinese, the North Koreans would have a lot of jet fuel to be able to use those jets. Right now, the North Koreans have the fourth largest military in the world, but it's also a military that is not nearly as effective as a, a fighting force that size would be because they don't have a lot of the equipment because we've been able to stop them from getting it. To say that North Korea has nuclear weapons and has missiles and therefore our sanctions are a failure is not necessarily true. Uh, the missiles do not reach Los Angeles or San Francisco. And Kim Jong-un has indicated that those cities, along with uh, Austin, Texas, for some reason, might be subjected to, to North Korean missiles. Uh, you know, we, we may be limited in terms of what we can do, and our sanctions aren't as effective as we'd like them to be. But I think we would... Uh, be severely criticized if we threw in the towel and said, oh, let's, let's send Kentucky Fried Chicken and Coca-Cola. Uh, Can I just I think, say that Australia yeah. does have diplomatic relations with uh, North Korea and South Korea, and unlike the Vatican, we have the same ambassador in South Korea accredited mm. to North Korea, though the post in North Korean ambassador is not filled at the moment in Canberra. Um, I, I saw some laughter about the mention of Austin, Texas. We should not laugh at such things because the truth of the matter is, and Americans have to reflect upon this in respect of drone technology, what you have today, somebody will have mm -hmm. in 20 or 30 years. And it's therefore extremely important that we put in place things in, in the United Nations, in the Security Council that will protect us all because otherwise there is an existential threat to our species. And this is something we've always got to keep in mind. Do not think that nothing can happen because nothing has happened. I grew up in, in the 1940s. I got two things. I got the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which every child at public schools in Australia got, and I got daily reminders of the mushroom cloud. And so it's very much in my mind. But young people, they don't think about it. Well, we've all got to think about it. We've got to think of drones. We've got to think of the Security Council. We've got to hope it will stand up for humanity because that's the thing we fundamentally share. We have time for one more question, and it seems an appropriate one to end on, which is what can we do diplomatically to convince the North Korean leadership that change is in their interest? Ambassador Chung. I see no way. <laughs> I see no way to convince them. I think... Um, uh, not diplomatic means. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we have uh, tried everything except real sanctions. And um, I think uh, unification or changing North Korean regime into one that uh, abides by international uh, you know, standards, civilized standards of the international community, that will be a solution, not only for the North Korean human rights problems, but also for the for their uh, uh, nuclear capabilities, um, and I think uh, uh, we need uh, more aggressive engagement policy, more aggressive engagement that can foster, that can encourage positive changes in North Korea. Um, and human context, I think we should uh, door wide open for more active uh, human engagement context with North Korean people to get our message across to North Korean people more broadcast that uh, into North Korean people that uh, Ambassador King is trying to do more hopefully more leaflets also this is a very uh, you know, old fashioned way but that's in some ways uh, effective in getting the message across to North Korean people so to get the truth about ourselves outside the world, about North, Korea, about North Korean themselves, into North Korean people. That would be, I think, uh, uh, the best way. And, uh, but in the meantime, in the meantime, I think we should uh, never compromise on, the, on the, the most fundamental human values 
uh, of uh, human rights. That's not something that we can compromise and or mix with other issues. Uh, I have several words of thanks uh, to my colleagues at the Asia Society, to all of you uh, for coming, uh, but mostly to three great panelists and those who preceded them. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.